McIntosh. My name is Ishan Mansuri. I am a pediatric emergency psychiatry fellow at Boston Children's Hospital. And I have created Humans of US Emily, where we get speakers to come and speak to our folks on different topics, including like residency stuff. Uh, so we held a conference for IMGs two weeks ago. We held a research conference last week. And this one is specifically focused on underrepresented in medicine folks. It's a smaller version of what we have been doing. Uh, but the crux of the matter is to get this information out to our students who cannot afford the expensive courses that uh, are there in mm -hmm. the market and uh, give them the skills they need to match to top-notch programs. So, Sounds good. Welcome. Uh, so over to you, Gabby. Your show. Yes. Yeah. Good afternoon. So my name is Gabriela Meyerson. I was third year psychiatry resident at the UCF College of Medicine here in Orlando, Florida. Um, you know, Dr. Zisha Mansuri, you know, um, asked if I could help collaborate and, you know, uh, bringing in some other folks that are considered underrepresented in medicine, um, parts of that community. So I brought, uh, helped organize uh, the event and brought some speakers. And uh, I just also want to say, first and foremost, thank you all so much for coming. Um, Hopefully you get some uh, insight out of this and each from a specialty pers specific perspective, but also in terms of like dealing with microaggressions and anti-racism policies and things like that, because those are all types of things that um, uh, each of us in some capacity will be discussing. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and introduce Dr. Tracy McIntosh. Um, so she's actually the Associate Dean for uh, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at the UCF College of Medicine here, the same uh, program that I'm in, but she's in the emergency medicine perspective. Uh, she's also the young clerkship director for um, the program as well. And she's uh, working here um, in our affiliate hospital, Osceola Regional Medical Center. Well, excuse me, HCA Florida Osceola Hospital now. Uh, the rebanding occurred relatively recently. Uh, she attended the uh, medical school at Yale School of Medicine and completed her residency training at Yale New Haven Hospital. Uh, just to come some more things about her as well, she's passionate about educational and research activities focused on developing innovative teaching strategies and on identifying and eliminating implicit bias and health disparities. She's well published and presents nationally on topics around GME curriculum advances around you know health disparities and trying to eliminate them. So enough about me talking, Dr. Tracy McIntosh, you take it away. Thank you so much for having uh, being here today. Thanks for inviting me to be part of this panel. Um, I would love to have some questions from the group so I can make sure that I am meeting your expectations and what you wanted to talk about. But I wanted to talk a bit about my journey. Uh, to the position that I'm in and help to give you some perspectives about when you are looking at different programs and uh, interviewing them, how can you make sure that their program is gonna be a good fit for you? And so as you're thinking about entering a residency program, your passion for service, your passion for helping others, your passion for social justice, for anti-oppression, um, finding the right program that will support that will allow you to pursue those passions without putting them on hold for three to five to seven years while you're in residency. And so some of the questions that I, that I, would, that I would be asking a residency program is, how does your curriculum address issues of health equity, health disparities? What opportunities are there for me as a resident to do community outreach while I'm in this program? What opportunities are current residents doing in their community to promote, to promote health equity? Are there opportunities for me to do an elective that focuses on those areas of passion for me? And so for me as a resident, I was passionate and I still am passionate about international health. And so I went to a residency program where they had connections and they had opportunities for me as a resident to go overseas. And so that was something that was really important for me that I was looking for in a program. In my program at HCA Osceola, we provide a social medicine elective for residents who are passionate about social medicine and about health equity. And that's an elective for residents to explore either a community-based project, partnering with a community, a social, a community service group. It's an opportunity for them to do work in our own hospital around health equity, looking at health disparities around sepsis outcomes or around maternal mortality or an opportunity to do a, a research project around health equity and health disparities. And so we have at our program a social medicine elective and I know other programs have that too. And so if this is part of your career trajectory, then look for opportunities within the residency experience that you will be able to develop these expertise. Being from a, from a minoritized group or a historically marginalized group or 
historically underrepresented in medicine group doesn't automatically make me an expert on issues of anti-oppression, LGBTQI health, on health equity necessarily. It gives me an important lens, an important perspective that I bring to a program, that I bring to a leadership team. Um, but you need to develop expertise through training, through mentorship, through scholarly work. And doing that while you're a resident will position you to take on a, a job as an attending to be a leader. Um, I myself, uh, I'm in my dream job right now as Associate Dean for Diversity. I have colleagues around the country who are doing this work in different capacities. I have a colleague in Michigan who's the Chief Diversity Officer for her health institution. I have colleagues who are CMOs of regions and they put this on their radar and they carry this as a mission that they execute in another capacity. And so um, around the nation, once you build these expertise, you will be able to have jobs that give you protected time to do this work, which is so important for saving lives um, in this nation. Um, for me as, a, as an emergency physician, I, I use the tools that I have, I use the privilege I have as a doctor um, to speak up for my patients. I've had a chance to speak for patients around um, patient billing, a surprise billing, and work with our Congress, Congressman Darren Soto in our district. And so I've been able to use my voice within the classroom, within the boardroom, but also in my community at large, having a seat at the table um, on a, and doing political advocacy. And so those are just some of the ways that I use my emergency medicine platform, uh, my role as Associate Dean of Diversity to try to have an impact, one, at the bedside with my patient, number two, with my medical students, with my residents, number three, at the hospital level, uh, with our CEO, CMO, putting these priorities on the agenda for everyone, and also in my greater community. So with that, you know, that's a little bit about myself. And again, what I would be looking for in a residency program as you are shopping around and deciding where's a good fit for you, ways that you can uh, ex explore these passions while you're a resident, because it's important to build expertise, to have a mentor who can guide you, to look for scholarly work, and to give you a sense of how you can uh, take this role into the hospitals, into the communities once you finish residency. With that, I, I'm open to any questions uh, for Q&A or um, anything else I could present on, I would be happy to do based on what the interest is of the group. So I think one question I had was that, uh, can you speak on the trends of emergency medicine, especially recently, I think the trends have been going down in terms of uh, how U.S. graduates are viewing emergency medicine, how that is playing a role in how they view it as a career. Are there enough jobs out there? Are people considering international graduates this time in an emergency medicine because of that trend? And if you could speak more on that. Yeah, great question. Um, two years ago, there was a, a workforce study that was published that looked at the rates of attrition, the rates that people were leaving the specialty and the rates that we were having mid-levels, that is nurse practitioners and physician associates entering emergency medicine, emergency departments and doing the work that emergency physicians were doing. And that study projected that by 2030, there would be an excess of emergency physicians of 10,000. And so the ripple effect of that study was that um, less students started to apply for emergency medicine. Um, because there was the prospect that you would no longer be able to get your desired job in Orlando, in San Francisco, in San Diego. Instead, these markets would be so saturated, you would either be forced to take a much lower salary or to go to a more rural area, which may be less desirable for you. And so uh, over the past two years, we have seen a decrease in the number of U.S. medical students, especially allopathic MD, going into emergency medicine. Uh, which has meant that there has been an increase in opportunity for international medical graduates and uh, osteopathic students to enter into, into emergency medicine in the United States. As a program, we have seen a decrease in the number of applicants that we've had year over year for the last two years, uh, which means that our, uh, our admitting USMLE step one scores, COMLEX scores have been downtrending over the past two years as well. So uh, as a US uh, program, 
affiliated with a allopathic medical school, uh, we had a predominance of MD students, US graduates over the first few years of our program. And now we are, uh, we're seeing a shift and accepting more uh, international medical students, which for us means predominantly from the Caribbean and a large proportion of osteopathic students. Our, uh, our average MCAT and complex scores have also decreased over the last two years. In reality though, for jobs, so that's just, I, I don't want that to send the message that our, our program is not desirable and emergency medicine is not desirable. There's been a new study this year <laughs> that showed that attrition that is number of physicians leaving emergency medicine has been uh, higher than what we what that original study expected. And so the tables have already turned in only 24 months, the pendulum has, is swinging back again. Um, docs are burning out across all specialties, but unfortunately, especially in emergency medicine, and we are seeing higher attrition rates. The study calculated 3.5% of doctors leaving every year. It's more like 5% uh, over the last two years with COVID taking a real a uh, higher proportion of the burden in ICU and emergency medicine. And so the, the demand for emergency medicine physicians is going up again. And so um, jobs are gonna be, um, the jobs will be there and salaries will be at what they are if not going up. Thank okay, you. I'll take this, I'm sorry. I can take the question if you'd like from Hansini. Um, what are the challenges that uh, doctors underrepresented in medicine face and what are programs trying to do about it? Um, some of the challenges that, that we face are um, microaggressions, our bias in the admissions processes, our, um, our discrimination, our flagrant insults and prejudice against us by uh, by our colleagues, by patients. And so addressing these issues head on is, is essential for programs. And that's something that I take very seriously leading, leading this charge at our hospital and in our consortium. What we're doing about this um, is I am charged with leading faculty development for a lot of the faculty who interact with students and learners. I oversee faculty development for the program directors around bias that is part of the interview process that can be limiting and can be exclusionary to folks from underrepresented groups. There's a tendency, one of the biases for interviewing is affinity bias, that everyone likes people who are like them, and I'm guilty of this. I love to admit students and residents who have a heart and a soul and a passion for social justice, for anti-oppression, for serving underrepresented communities. And so I would love to fill our entire programs just with people like me, but of course I need diversity. I need people who are gonna and who are just gonna take care of the next patient and be incredibly efficient in the emergency department. I need folks who are gonna invent the next, you know, treatment for stroke. We need all types of people in medicine, and that includes, you know, racial, ethnic background, gender and sexual minorities. That includes folks from different, um, different, you know, intellectual capacities, folks with different emotional intelligence, all types, and. Uh, I need to understand that there's value in diversity and not just having people who are like me, who I want to hang out with on a Friday night, who I think will be a great fit for our program. That excludes folks who bring a different perspective, who bring richness and who will allow us to innovate, who will allow us to improve in a way that a group that's like-minded with the same background, the same perspective can never innovate, can never grow and be better. Part of our curriculum um, we have a longitudinal curriculum over 18 months that repeats that I oversee the DEI curriculum to make sure I'm training your colleagues, I'm training our faculty to understand these principles of health equity to be, uh, to be introducing those at the bedside to you. And I know um, our surgery curriculum, they I partner with them. Psychiatry, they have their own curriculum. ob has their own curriculum. I support neurology and emergency and internal medicine. So all the programs are, are moving in a, in a direction that, in, uh, that addresses that these have been some omissions in our curriculum in the past, addressing these very important issues around how to treat each other around health equity, health disparities, and around how to address and eliminate microaggressions in the workplace so that it's not toxic for folks. So that people can come to work and do the work and not be blindsided by, by hate and ugly comments that just derail my, my mental focus for the patients in front of me.
Um, and next question I'll address is uh, some resources to help underrepresented minorities find a support system, including mentors and advisors um, to support medical school and residency applications. So what I know about in emergency medicine is we have our American College of Emergency Physicians um, Diversity, Inclusion, Health Equity subgroup. And uh, through this group, students can, to, can tap into mentors who are committed to doing some one-on-one -on -one meetings with them. And so I would start with all the professional societies and professional groups for the specialty that you're interested in and focus on their URM uh, physician network and see what resources they have because probably they have something set up to match applicants and students to existing attendings in those specialties and to help you to understand how you can be successful. So I have some other questions um, here as well that were sent to me. Um, to Dr. McIntosh, what specific steps have been taken with regards to making diverse folks feel more welcome either that you've seen on like a national level or more, I guess, regional or even program specific? Yeah, um, what I've seen on a national level is um, most physician groups have identified the importance of having affinity groups within the organization. And so these affinity groups focus on the issues of that underrepresented in medicine folks feel. And so I'm a part of, I mentioned our diversity, inclusion and health equity group for emergency physicians and having a meeting space, having separate agenda items that we address when we come to our national conferences, this is a way for us to build support. Um, resilience should not be about the individual, it should be about the organizations. And it's a way for us to address how can we ensure that our organizations have our backs on issues? How do we ensure that the statements put forward by our organizations include the perspectives of diverse groups? And so having a seat at the national table with these organizations is essential to prioritizing the needs and, and the realities of diverse, diverse physicians that make up these specialties. Coming down to the level of you know, the hospital, um, we work for a very large hospital network. It's the largest for-profit health, health network in America called the Hospital, um, health, hospital Corporation of America, HCA. And so within this HCA family, there's great opportunity for folks who have this, um, who have these perspectives, who come from underrepresented groups to come together and to prioritize strategies to have an impact. And so I'm part of the GME group and we are trying to understand how can we increase diversity in our recruitment of residents? How do we have a better curriculum for residents of all backgrounds to address these issues? And so this is on a national scale, having strategies that work, having strategies that are sustainable. And um, there's a place for everyone uh, among this group. It doesn't just need to be folks who are underrepresented, but we also need to make sure that folks who are underrepresented are not overburdened with this work. And so having a diverse group matters so much from that perspective as well. And then from a hospital perspective, we have a GME group of residents and attendings and uh, Dr. Meyerson is a part of that, bringing the perspectives of residents. And what are folks experiencing on the ground? What's it like to be a resident today in this hospital? What are you experiencing? What's going great? What's not going great? And how can we put some structures in place for folks to get together and talk, to build resilience, to learn about um, strategies that can improve wellness and to fix things that are, that are a problem? And how do we go about that? Sometimes we need to, you know, call people to task as individuals. Sometimes we need to do broad educational strokes to bring everyone up to speed. All right, thank you. I think we have uh, another uh, question in the general chat here. Um, how do programs actually move the needle from advocacy on DEI issues to ensuring accountability for these initiatives in the affected populations? Mm -hmm. um, and so. Um, metrics. Part of, you know, the double-edged the double -edged sword is, you know, metrics help us to move, to know, are we doing anything impactful? <laughs> are there more folks from underrepresented groups? Um, but it also kind of can lead to some burnout because this work cannot really be quantified. I will not achieve health equity in my career. And, you know, having a goal that I'm always striving for, that can lead to burnout. And I feel like I'm not ever accomplishing anything when actually you know, it's, I'm trying to change people's hearts and minds, and there's no metric for that. And so that's a double-edged sword. So I, I understand the value of metrics and setting goals. Um, but at the end of the day, I'm not trying to, you know, fix, you know, number of patients I see an hour. I'm trying to fix how people treat each other. 
and that's that's a hard thing to put my finger on. Um, but I understand that you know both of those things matter. Having goals to set and achieve, but also you know how do I how do you put a number on how people treat each other? Um, I can find ways to do it, but I also don't want to burn out and and feel like I've accomplished nothing in my career, in my day, in my week if I don't meet those numbers. We also have some some strategies for accountability in terms of you know how faculty progress and how they pro get promoted and. And at the University of Central Florida, in my department, <laughs> we've initiated uh, a requirement where faculty have to demonstrate commitment and activity around DEI in order to be promoted. And so I provide them with a menu of items that they can do to, to help with research, to help with outreach, to help with mentoring, um, and letting them know that I can help them to accomplish those things because everyone needs to have a little piece of this. If a few of us are doing it, we burn out, we get tired, we quit. If everyone's doing a little piece related to their field, related to their expertise, then we can really move this ship in a profound way. And so you all know that, you know, the way that a cruise ship navigates is with a little rudder, a little adjustment, everyone doing a little bit, we move this whole ship, this whole institution, this whole field of medicine gets moved. And at the end of the day, patients are better off and folks who do the work uh, are better off as well. Yeah, thank you. And I had another question sent here in the chat. If you had to choose again in the current scenario, the current uh, climate um, throughout emergency medicine, would you choose it? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I, um, I love, love, love my job. For folks who are thinking about emergency medicine, I'm going to put a plug in for you for this amazing specialty. In a country where so many people are uninsured, uh, so many people are undocumented, so many people can't afford to drive a car to their primary care doctor's office. So many people can't take a day off work and get paid. The emergency department is there for all these people. We are there as a safety net for, for medicine, for when doctor's offices are closed. We're there for the safety nets for social services when people can't get access. We're there for the safety net for people 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And that is the calling of this specialty that I love more than anything. Our motto is anyone anything, anytime. And the fact that we can do that so well in this country where people trust us with their lives, with their family members, it's the greatest privilege. It's, it's, it's very humbling. And it's something that I'm happy to, to wake up and give up time with my family on a holiday when most other specialties are closed and are enjoying Thanksgiving with their family members. A third of my team is in the hospital. Like most of, you know, that's hospital medicine. A third of our teams are in the hospital doing what needs to be done putting our families second and putting our patients first. And so if you feel like that's something that you are willing to do because of the calling to just be there for anybody, anytime, then the reward is immense. The team mentality um, of doing resuscitation with a nurse and a paramedic and a student and a x-ray technician and an attending. Um, I love that team spirit and that together we can accomplish so much. So yes, I would choose a specialty. If the demand goes down, I'll make it work. If the demand goes up, then, you know, then there's more space for more people to do this work. Thank you. And um, I, uh, I actually um, really mirror what a lot of the comments are saying. That's very beautifully well said. I should get that embroidered somewhere and place in my home. Thank you so much. It's very inspiring. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm a jokester, so Dr. McIntosh knows this. Um, I have another uh, question here that was provided in the chat. As an ING, we may not be fully tuned with the struggles faced by those underrepresented in medicine. What signs can we look out for during our residency and what can we do to help? Yeah, great question. So uh, for folks who uh, grew up and uh, went to medical school outside of uh, an American institution or a, an American affiliated institution, uh, you may not know about the history of structural racism in America. Um, you may not know about the reality of Jim Crow and the implication of separate but equal that never was equal in America's history. And so coming to America to practice medicine um, as a resident, um, I would encourage you to, to do some work to understand the fabric of American society and how racism actually does exist and it permeates through all of our institutions and how as a doctor coming in, how you can better navigate those things. And so 
um, one of the one of the myths is that okay, growing up poor in America, so what? I grew up poor in you know my country, and I still made it. But without an understanding of structural racism in America and how it plays out, it's hard to understand the realities and the intricacies of American society. And so, if you're coming in without the background of our history, of how racism was a fabric of this institution of healthcare, of education, of politics, um, it's hard to understand. How it could, the country can be so rich, but our health disparities are so profound. And for you to really understand how you can have a big impact on this in your career, there will need to be some education, some reading, um, because it's complicated um, and it's real. Yeah, absolutely. I agree with you 100%. Um, unless you're in that country, there's, I mean, everywhere, there's all, every country has like its own rich history um, to some extent and another and understanding the social dynamics at play um, can certainly be helpful in navigating um, you know, healthcare structures and things like that. Um, we have another uh, question here in the chat. Um, so this one's coming from, here this is an individual who's doing medical school in the Philippines and they've noticed that there's few IM programs that have graduates from the Philippines. Um, and they, add, they asked, is that something that can add to the diversity of a program being from the Philippines? And how could I emphasize that? Or how could this individual emphasize that in their letter of interest, sending out to uh, programs? Um, that's a great point. And I, I think you should emphasize the importance of the perspective that you bring that is diverse. And so within, uh, within your application, help us to understand uh, your lived experience and what you're bringing to a patient encounter that will help a patient. Um, bring to that application your expertise in different languages because that's gonna be an asset to you as you come to the United States. Um, our patient population in Florida is very diverse and around the country you'll have pockets that are very diverse. And so please emphasize your perspective, your lived experience, how you can quickly relate to a patient, uh, how you seek to make cultural connections with patients even who are not like you and how you have that experience and any language skills that you're bringing, those are good to emphasize as well. Yeah, absolutely, I concur, especially if you're fluent in languages that can be a little tough to find on our language line, um, can be very helpful and very resourceful. So another question that was sent here, um, this is asking for someone that is an ally of underrepresented folks in medicine, and they wanted to know how that they can support their colleagues in those initiatives. And, you know, if they see something, you know, either through actions or through, um, you know, just other types of initiatives. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we can't underestimate the role of allies in being a part of these committees and being a part of um, lectures and being a part of just any kind of events that you see. And so uh, if you're in an, if you have an opportunity to join a committee, to join an organization, even if you don't necessarily identify racially um, from your um, gender identity as a minoritized person, please still join uh, because your voice sometimes carries even more than their voice. When you are in a situation and you hear something that is offensive, that is ugly, please, speak up because again, sometimes your voice carries more weight than their voice. And it's hard um, to always be the only person who is of a certain identity. And to be asked to speak for all black people, to be asked to, to explain rate, how I experience racism in America. These are questions that the person who's the only one of that identity is always having to field. And sometimes they hate it. Sometimes they don't wanna explain everything. And so if you're in that position, uh, being a voice matters tremendously and it takes the burden off of that other person and it helps to move the, move the agenda forward. Because again, sometimes the, uh, if you come from a more dominant group, your voice is sometimes more respected and people who relate to you from an identity perspective, see you as a safe person to have some, some more difficult conversations with, whereas they may be more guarded to have, to say something honest in front of somebody who's different from them. And so there's a lot of value just to speak up and to join these committees and to, to be an advocate because, because again, the, the weight sometimes of your voice over somebody else's voice, which it shouldn't be, but that's just the reality. Yes, thank you for that. And I think it also, it, it, exactly what you mentioned is that those allies, some people may feel a little more comfortable asking them certain types of questions so they don't wanna have that 
particular person that's part of that demographic to feel uncomfortable or anything like that. So I think it's a great point. Thank you. Um, here we have uh, another question. What do you make of the recent Supreme Court um, overruling, I guess, overturning Roe v. Wade uh, regarding abortion, the effects it will have on residency applications in general and in applications in particular? Um, we're still waiting to see how this is going to play out because as emergency physicians, we we still don't know, am I going to get my wrist slapped for things that were always part of my practice? Um, so my approach is from a health equity perspective, and we know that the data is 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 solid that unsafe abortions are dangerous for women. And unsafe abortions will start to increase if safe abortions are no longer available. And so that is that is the perspective that I take to most issues uh, in healthcare is what is the equity perspective that we need to be focused on. And, you know, and a person's opinion, um, you know, everyone is, everyone is entitled to their opinion. Um, but what matters is health outcomes and um, patient safety for me. And so that's what I'm focused on. And so we'll see uh, hopefully we'll be able to still practice medicine that is safe for everyone and that allows um, women's health to be an issue of of equity and that we're not allowing this issue to create more more health disparities in communities that don't have the the ability to pick out to buy a plane ticket and go wherever they want to have an abortion but instead stuck um, having unsafe abortions uh, because that's what they that's what they can afford. Mm -hmm. And I think every single specialty in medicine will advocate for patient safety uh, in, in the way that they feel most appropriate. Um, another question here. So should IMGs who are not studying in a Caribbean school apply to emergency medicine? If so, how should they build their profile? What scores are needed? What other types of metrics like research publications, things like yeah. that? Um, there's a website that I'll look up um, before I end this call that will that shows you every single program, at least for emergency medicine. And it tells you exactly who they will admit and what the metrics are. And so without spending a dollar, without spending any time um, on applications that may not be fruitful, go to, this app, go to this website and look at the different programs you're interested in and see if they accept applicants from your medical school and see what is the minimum step one score that they're looking for, what is the minute, minimum COMLEX score that they're looking for and what else is necessary for an application. Because if you don't meet those minimum requirements, it's a waste of your time and money. And so start with that website for emergency medicine and look for comparable ones for whichever specialty you're looking for. That is a nice um, nice summary of all the programs so that you can have a one place to shop around and figure out where can you, where can you put your eggs. I think to, to follow up on that question, the reason the question is being asked is that IMGs were not traditionally considered for emergency medicine in general, like hardly a handful of IMGs have matched over the years especially non-Caribbean IMGs. <laughs> so when, for other specialties, we look at the criteria, IMGs have to score higher, do more research, do more rotations to be able to even get an interview at any of the programs. So in the same way for emergency medicine, how much would be the bar? Like, for example, say if the average score for a program would be 230, 230 for US grads. Do you think the same standard would apply to IMGs or they would need a much higher score to even gain an interview or score an interview? Okay, yes, I think that would be the case. Um, so the, the few IMGs uh, we have interviewed, they, they demonstrated just, they were extremely successful, extremely almost prolific in their programs. And, uh, and that's what it took for them to, to be uh, considered and for us to be able to advocate, to be able to apply for the visa for folks, because generally we don't, uh, our program doesn't apply for visas. And so that was a type of exceptional candidate that, that our program uh, wanted to recruit. And so published, um, known in their country as a, as a expert in emergency medicine. So it was not, it was not a level playing field, but that would, that was an applicant that our institution wanted to go to bat for and, and apply for a visa on their behalf. So, so to add on to that, wouldn't that also be considered a sort of a discrimination in a way? Because if you look at engineering, like for example, Apple or Google, they are choosing the best folks irrespective of where they come from. So if we apply the same criteria here, if we have a fantastic, I mean, a reasonably good candidate, that person should also score an interview. So that is also in a way uh, a problem if we look at it, since we are discussing discrimination. Yeah, I agree with that. I think for us, we, we haven't been, uh, we don't know much about the institutions outside of the ones that we are affiliated with uh, within the US and in the Caribbean that we have 
uh, that, that are uh, American associated institutions that we have known track records with where these students, importantly, they rotate at American institutions. And so they understand, um, they understand the, they do clerkships with us. They understand how medicine works in the US. They understand emergency medicine in the United States. And so uh, that's what we're comparing students on. And so having a rotation in the US would help you to get a special letter. And so in the United States to apply for emergency medicine, you need a very special letter called the standardized letter of evaluation. The, the, we call it a slow. And so you need to be able to get a slow in order to really be considered for an interview in the United States. Unless you're this exceptional candidate from your own, uh, in your own country already. True, true, true. So, so for the slow, so for example, say if someone has graduated from an international school and they want to get this flow, do you think that if they do a rotation, even after graduation, would that be considered? And what are the components of a slow? Like what would be a strong slow letter for a candidate like that? Yeah. Um, yes. When I'm looking at applications, we accept slows. Um, there are standard ones from the United States, but if you're getting one from a, a from a faculty member who is not affiliated with the United States institution, then they have a, a separate kind of slow. And what's unique about the slow is it compares students to students. And so I am forced as a letter writer to put students into three buckets, top third, middle third, bottom third. And then that allows us to have some more objectivity because I would love to say that everybody is a 10 out of 10, but that's not really, that's not right. Not everyone is a 10 out of 10. And so the standardized letter for emergency medicine is unique because it requires that we you know, rank students and so that I have a better sense of how a student performed on their rotation. And so as long as at some point you've done a emergency medicine rotation to get a slow, then that puts you uh, that puts you uh, in a plane where we can be comparing candidates. Thank you so much. Just having Thank letters you. of recommendation from your chair and from a family friend in a place where you worked, those are not seen in the same light as a standardized letter of, of evaluation in emergency medicine. True, true, very true. Thank you for that insightful answer. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Also teaching me what a slow is. I'm in my little psychiatry bubble. So I'm learning a little bit more about from different specialties. So thank you about that. Um, another question here, how is the transition from training to becoming an attending? And how does one go about seeking effective mentorship? Um, the training from emergency medicine residency to an attending um, is very graduated. And so the first year as an intern, you see patients that are not that sick and you have an attending by your side watching you do procedures, um, reviewing your notes carefully, double, triple checking parts of your history and physical. And then as a second year, you see sicker patients and you're expected to see them faster. And as a third year, you're expected to really be running the department because that's what the job is. Um, and so in emergency medicine, our job as faculty is to have you graduate through these responsibilities, sicker patients and seeing more patients so that as an attending, generally in America, you're seeing about 2.2 patients per hour. That's how fast you need to be working. And so, yes, we would love to have an hour to sit and talk to a patient uh, like Dr. Meyerson maybe gets to. <laughs> um, but the reality is sick people keep coming in. They don't schedule appointments and I need to be ready to see whatever comes in exactly when they need to be seen. And so the skill of emergency physicians is number one is to be great clinicians to come up with differentials. But number two is to be able to flex and see the sickest patients when they show up. They don't make appointments. And so I need to be flexible and I need to master those skills. Okay, thank you. And, and there was a the part record. two that I forgot. Yes. Oh, my apologies. Go yeah, on the record me... first. Go on the record first with how. Oh, that I don't. I don't take an hour to do my psychiatric evaluations. Aww. Not anymore. I know it seems like that when you read my when you read our notes. But <laughs> joking aside, let me just scroll back to where we were. Um, oh, pardon one moment. Oh, and the part two. So, how does one go about seeking effective mentorship? Yeah, mentoring, it's its a two-way street. And so number one is finding the mentor. And so uh, cold calls, that they work for me. People email me out of the blue and then I, I make time on my calendar for folks. Um, but then the second part is, you know, how do you maintain a main mentoring relationship? So it's the easiest thing in the world is, you know, I meet Dr. Meyerson at a conference. I go up to her afterwards and I say, okay, can I email you? And of course, yes. And so I send that first email, but then it just fizzles. Then we, then that was it. I got my one meeting with, with my mentor and then I, nothing ever came of it. And so the second part of it is made, how do you maintain a meaningful mentoring relationship? And so, you know, for you as a mentee is to have some specific goals. What am I trying to get out of this? You know, am I just trying to make a connection quickly or am I trying to 
you know, build my portfolio as a, as a academician. And I want some mentoring around how do I do more, more research? Am I trying to get a job in Chicago? And so I'm trying to maintain this relationship for when a job opens up. And so as a mentee, what do you want? And once you have that carved out, once you have that for yourself, then you can, the mentor can help you to achieve that. But most of, most of the time when students contact me, they just want to just meet up. And from my perspective, that's easy for me to do, but that's not really, um, it's hard for me as a mentor to want to maintain that because I have a lot of, you know, demands on my time, but I don't really know what it is that I can do to help you if I don't know what your goals are. So set goals and then I'll help me to understand how I can help you meet them. And then that's easier for us as mentors. Absolutely. Thank you uh, for providing that insight because, you know, mentors, obviously there could be some friendship involved, but it's more like, what, what can I do to help you and help you reach your career goals? hundred um, percent. So there's actually a, a couple of questions here. I, Mar Sophia, uh, hopefully I'm pronouncing your name correctly. If not, you can chastise me uh, both in the, the group chat and in the individually. If there's such a high demand in emergency medicine, should the application process be less competitive to meet the needed numbers? Yeah. So um, you'll, um, you'll see that uh, this year, emergency medicine will be less competitive, meaning that the average scores getting into programs is lower than it's ever been before. And you'll see that uh, there, are few, there are more spots for uh, IMG and osteopathic students this year than, than there were in past years. And so um, we have more students that we've taken from the SOAP uh, across the country, more programs, 25% of programs for emergency medicine last year were unfilled. 25% of programs had unfilled slots. Never before have we seen that. So less, less competitive this year as well. Thank you. And then the follow-up to that also is how important it is to know how to perform procedures often done in the ER prior to starting residency. Yeah. Um, so it's essential that we build the muscle memory for uh, our residents during residency so that when you're in attending that these are things that are easy for you and that are facile. Um, but there are procedures that you will only do as a resident and then do once in your career. And so an example of that is uh, called a pericardiosynthesis where you put a needle into the per pericardial sac to pull blood out. And so I've only done that once as an attending and I trained on it as a resident over and over for that one time that I did an as attending. Maybe I'll do it again, but maybe I never will. And so that's the important thing about training is that sometimes it'll be simulation. Sometimes it'll be on a, on a donor cadaver like you did in medical school in anatomy lab, because that one time that you do it and a life is on the line, you've got to be good. You can't look it up in the books. You can't look up a YouTube video. There's no time. You just have to act. Absolutely. Thank you. And also, um, you don't want your third year psychiatry resident performing that procedure either. Um, so another question I have here in the chat. So I would like, um, they'd like for you to compare your experience, um, you know, now that you're here at UCF um, versus like you know, when you did your medical training in Yale. Mm -hmm. um, so 15 years ago when I was an intern at Yale, um, there was, uh, there was uh, not much focus on metrics on, you know, how fast I was or, you know, how fast the department was. Like, I didn't really know those things were important. And so I don't know if that's a 15 year shift or if it's a difference between uh, an academic versus a community uh, institution. And so I should probably just ask my colleagues about that. But that was the biggest thing that I noticed that when I, when I started as an attending um, in corporate medicine, uh, that there was much more attention to metrics. How many patients are you seeing comparing it to your peers? Uh, how good are your patient satisfaction scores comparing it to your peers? And those are things as a resident, I was just oblivious about. Um, but those are things that at every hospital people are keeping track of. And so just, you know, going from being a student to a, a resident, these are realities that unfortunately are part of practicing medicine in America these days. Um, but my job as a faculty is not to let that overshadow the more important thing, which is you connecting with the patient, taking the time to do a thorough history and physical, finding out about their puppy and finding out about things that make patients, you know, who they are and coming up with good differentials and good management plans. But the other parts of the business of medicine, um, we are including those into our curriculum because we don't want attendings to be blindsided, blindsided when they start a job that they didn't know any of those things were important because we were just so focused on coddling people and, and just focusing on just the pathophysiology and not the bigger business of medicine, which, which as attendings you're all responsible for. 
Thank you. And I, I'd actually personally like to add to that question as well. Um, you know, going from a larger academic institution is more of a community based. How would you say like the patient population um, that you saw? I mean, I know obviously New Haven, Connecticut, just different region of the country, but how, how would you compare the patient populations? Um, not too different, not too different. So um, New Haven, Connecticut has a very large um, divide in socioeconomic status, um, a large underserved community and um, caring for those patients was essential. We had a better follow-up and this is state by state variation. And so in Connecticut, they have state tax, they have better social support systems, they have better um, health insurance programs for those who don't have it through their employer in ways that Florida does not prioritize, does not think is important uh, to take care of their, their citizens in that way. Uh, Florida does not have state tax, and so we don't have funds for those types of programs that help to help people who don't have it through their jobs. And so that's the biggest contrast for me. It's Connecticut versus Florida, as opposed to you know one institution necessarily versus another. Thank you. And I think it's also a good point is depending on where you're not just necessarily if it's community, you know, compared to academic institution, but the state laws and um, other types of yeah. factors come into play yeah. as well. Um, so another question that I received, uh, how can one learn to become more culturally sensitive? You know, with regards to, you know, racial demographics, LGBTQ yeah. demographics and understanding microaggressions and, you know, really how to respond to them. Yeah, um, a couple of things. First, uh, I would recommend that folks do a, an implicit bias test. And so these are well-validated tests um, out of Harvard where you can understand, wait a minute, am I biased? Do I hold biases against a certain identity group? Um, because I thought I was raised to see, um, to be colorblind, and I thought that I treat everyone the same. And so start with one of those things on your own time and just run through it and see, wow, I do hold this bias. This is part of my upbringing. This is part of the messages around me from my parents and from my grandparents and from my uncle and my auntie who say these things about these communities. And I have internalized those when I actually thought that I didn't. And so that's the first place is to figure out what is the impact of your upbringing, of the messaging in our society on how you view different, different parts of our population. And then from there, you know, if you find out that you have some work to do, then uh, you know, just Google a good book list um, to help you around those areas. And so you know, around racism, I, you know, I could propose a bunch of good ones, but whatever it is that you find that you have work to do is to do the work. And, um, and it is to is to push yourself out of your comfort zone so that you can actually grow. And so if I, for example, if I don't understand, you know, what is this Black Lives Matter? I still don't understand what it is. Who cares? You know, all lives matter. If I don't understand it. Asking my friend who is just like me, grew up in the same community, has the same perspective. The two of us are gonna both not understand together and think that the whole world is crazy. But if I can read a book and actually try to learn about it, that's how I really have understanding. So I need to seek a perspective that is different from mine. If I'm confused about something, if I have a, a friend who is from a different identity that, that is, has the courage to talk to me and that we can have a meaningful conversation, that's great. But if I don't have any friends from a different group, then I probably need to do some work that's gonna be reading, watching some videos, but not watching videos that are from people just like me who are ranting and raving, but from people who can provide me some education from a different lens. That's what I'm looking for, a different perspective. So for me, an example is uh, I live in Florida, I'm Canadian where we don't have the same uh, gun, um, uh, same perspective on gun, uh, gun ownership that Americans, some Americans do. And so for me, I don't understand, uh, I don't understand it. I understand the history of America, but I really don't get it. So I have some colleagues in the emergency department who are, who are, who think that gun ownership is an important part of their identity. And so I like to talk to them about it so I can understand where is this coming from? Because I, if I ask my own friends, all of us are confused about it. We don't understand. Why can't there just be more regulations, more laws? Why do we need all these guns? And then I talk to my gun owning friends and then I can understand it better. Absolutely, thank you. Um, I guess just down the road from us, not too far away, you can actually sh uh, shoot a machine gun for rental. So just uh, even more adding to the stereotype of the gun culture we have here in America. Um, another question here, um, and also just your ranting and raving, I will listen to all day, Dr. McIntosh, so thank you. Um, another question, though, before I get too sidetracked and tangential, how to balance the transition from being a clinician to an administrator and a clinician? Um, 
Yeah. So what is it like to go from taking care of just the patient in front of you day in, day out to then taking a step back and figuring out how can we run this institution better? How can I help these doctors who I work with to be happier, to be more effective, to have more joy in their work? How can we help these group of doctors to have fewer complications? This is tremendous work that our administrators do. And so for folks who want to step away from the bedside and kind of take a bird's eye view of how to help the system run better, I commend you. Um, that's you know part of why I transitioned to an academic role because I wanted to take a step back and see how can I do this work better on a systems level. And so it does require some new uh, strategies around time management. Um, it requires um, some new diplomacy skills and uh, some leadership development in yourself, either through courses, certifications, um, extensive reading, maybe an MBA, a master's in health administration, something else. But uh, those are all the ways that you can gain the skills. At HTA, our institution, there would be programs for residents who want to uh, then become academicians, want to become teachers, want to get into healthcare administration. And so uh, within your institutions, there may be those opportunities to gain the skills so that you can then be a leader in your institution and, uh, and start to take on some other issues outside the, beyond the bedside, but will also translate to improved outcomes for patients ultimately. And I'll second that. It's, it's very helpful to have um, people in the administrative aspect that were clinicians before and understand you know, the nuts and bolts and really what it takes to run an inpatient psychiatric unit, run an emergency uh, department, things like that. Uh, another question here. Um, so with regards to, you know, microaggressions and just sometimes just even some harassment, you know, there is dynamics in medicine, there's a hierarchy and depending on what institution that'd be a little more than others. How do you feel, um, you know, if that administration would be like, retaliatory when you're speaking up and how do you seek help if that does in fact happen? Would you seek legal counsel from a lawyer, for example, or any other steps that you feel others should take in that situation? Great question. Um, so I would encourage folks to learn the hierarchy of where you're going so that when you're an intern and something happens, you know who you're supposed to report to. And so as an intern coming into our hospital, there are a couple ways for you to report uh, issues, microaggressions, discrimination, uh, unfair grades based on you know, sexual identity, race, religion. And so we have an anonymous QR code that you can anonymously submit something. Or you should feel comfortable going to your chief, but if you don't, I understand that. Or you should feel comfortable going to your program director, but if you don't, I understand that. Um, and so we have different opportunities for you to report anonymously, but also um, in a confidential manner. Beyond that, if you are a faculty member, you have your medical director, you have your chief medical officer, uh, I've reported unprofessional behavior from another attending to my chief medical officer by way of a non-anonymous email because I wanted, I wanted some more teeth to it and I was willing to have a face-to-face -face conversation with this individual if that's what needed to happen. So I did not need an anonymity in my situation, but somebody else may feel that they needed that. And so um, both of those should be ways for you to report things. When you report things, I'm not seeking to have people kicked out of my institution necessarily. I'm seeking to have people have a conversation, a discussion and learn the impact of their words so that they can be better. If, if I say something to Dr. Meyerson and it was offensive, I would like to have a conversation so that I can improve and to have a new perspective. I don't wanna only be talked about when I'm about to be kicked out of an institution. I would like an opportunity to help everyone improve how they deal with each other. And so that's what I wanna give an opportunity to my faculty that I can provide some coaching, some feedback, so that they can have a new perspective and see, wow, oh, I never thought of it that way. Oh, I didn't know that my words could come across in such a negative way. And so look for those avenues within your system, um, but it's not that you're gonna be reporting things anonymously on Google. That's, that's really never the answer for professionals. It's that you know your hierarchy, you know how to report. And if that doesn't work, then you should know outside of that, how can you report things if really you're falling on, dumb, on deaf ears that you, there's still another way without just putting it on you know, on the web and blasting everyone because then everyone just puts up a defense and there's really, it's not as constructive as it may feel cathartic to you as, as a reporter. 
So suffice it to say, don't go on Instagram live and confront actively is what I yeah. hear. So yeah, thank it's going to have consequences for people's careers. And so, yes, sometimes people are going to jump on, jump on it and say, yeah, that was absolutely wrong. We all support you. Here's money for your legal defense fund. Um, but sometimes it can have, uh, can have negative consequences for learners as an attending it's different. And so as an attending, um, I feel that uh, well, my job is to speak up for these issues. And so that's why I'm happy to, to do this role and speak up for, on behalf of others. Um, but, you know, I don't, I'm not in a position where I can't afford to walk away from this job if I doesn't agree with my morals, or if I can't afford to be fired for speaking up for something that I think is important. And so, you know, you want to get to that stage in your career where your finances are in order so that you don't have what we call golden handcuffs to your job where you're just miserable because you don't, you hate it. You don't like the people you work with. It's toxic. There's microaggressions and or racism or sexism from your boss and you can't do anything about it. You feel so silent. You don't want to be in that position where you could never walk away for your own wellness, for your own self. Absolutely. Well said. I have a question here in the chat again. Um, so as a woman of color, which states or regions of uh, the United States do you feel are more friendly for underrepresented folks or folks that could be considered a racial minority in this country? Um, I haven't traveled to throughout the whole country. So I would say from my experiences, um, the Northeast is great. The Southeast is great. The Northwest is great. The Midwest, Chicago, Minnesota, that's all great. And California definitely is great. Um, those are all places where it, it, I know it's very diverse. And um, those are places, I think those would be great places to start. Thank you. And we have here, is it true that even, uh, or that nurse practitioners and physicians um, assistants will bill in the ED, the insurances pay 85% of what they would pay for an MD or a DO or another, uh, you know, graduate, uh, you know, physician degree from that's equivalent. Yeah, I believe that is true. Okay. And I think this is a follow-up or something similar, I guess, in the financial space. Can you comment on the pay difference between academic and non-academic <clears throat> hospitals in the community? Um, yeah, so <laughs> um, comparing the salaries for, you know, full academicians uh, at the institution where I was um, in the Northeast, I believe maybe they were about two thirds what, what a community, like a straight clinician might make. And that's because um, paying, the pay is the highest for seeing patients. That is when you make the most money. And so doing anything outside of that will make less money. And so if I'm focused on studying the impact of, okay, I'm gonna try an example of this group with uh, a medication assisted treatment for opioid abuse. If that's my passion is to figure out how do I get Suboxone, buprenorphine into my patients with opioid addiction disorders in the emergency department so that I can save lives. If that's my passion, that's not gonna pay as much money as the person who is seeing patients 2.2 an hour 12 hours a day, five days a week. And so it's just different work. Each one is important, but the dollars are higher for seeing patients day in, day out. But if your passion is having an impact on community health, on public health, on lives on a larger scale, um, the joy and the reward will be non, uh, will be still great. Um, but just the dollar to dollar is, it's not a comparison. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. And every place that you can work again has its positives and, and negatives and you know academics you know it works for academics community setting and they're all different types of places yeah. so thank you for providing some insight into that yeah, but the, the trade-off folks for for the idea that okay i just want to make as much money as possible seeing as many patients as possible there is a trade-off there is a cost to that and so the data show that the happiest doctors are the ones that have something else that they do actually outside of medicine and so if you want to be an academician, you want to run a program like Dr. Meyerson's program director in, in psychiatry and helping guide the next generation, lead the next generation, inspire the next generation. There is higher joy in, in that type of job. They, they're the happiest people. Program directors are some of the happiest physicians because they love what they do. They love inspiring, mentoring, teaching. Um, and so there is, there is a little bit of trail. The, the doctors who have like a niche, who are absolute experts in something, present and teach on a national scale that are like applauded for their contributions, like that brings a lot of joy too. 
Um, for me, uh, transitioning a little bit outside, away from clinical medicine, that is having a buy down to academics, that allowed me to, to get through COVID unscathed. Um, there was a lot of burnout in COVID and seeing patients day in, day out, dealing with uh, you know, anti-vaxxers who were gaslighting doctors. Um, that took a big toll on us. And so stepping away and doing more DEI academics, that was protective for me at that time. Absolutely. And I, um, I, I concur with that in terms of finding your passion will make going to work more enjoyable. And mm -hmm. for some people, it is seeing as many patients as possible. For others, it's going into the medical education perspective. It is um, the other, you know, pr trying to put, promote DEI initiatives in their hospital or their place of work. Okay, so uh, there's a question here. So um, at least in psychiatry has been more, uh, you know, programs that have been opening up. Um, so with regards to that, Someone's asking about, okay, like a new program, maybe not quite as established that has, you know, great area to live in versus maybe a top program in place that maybe doesn't click as many boxes in terms of, um, you know, the location. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Um, I was a new program six, seven years ago. And what you got when you took a chance on us was a faculty who were uh, completely energized to teach and provide, you know, one-on-one -on -one mentoring because it was a small group of residents um, who went to bat for each resident who was not stuck in doing things a certain way. And so that's, that's what you get when you take a chance on a program. Um, in our case, we had strong faculty research already. Um, we had folks who already were kind of niche in a lot of areas. And so you want to have a program that is new, but that has uh, if it has faculty that are established in, in areas that you would be interested in pursuing, so you have mentorship and so that if you want to do a fellowship, then you're going to be led along that path. But there, there's good reason to take a chance on a new program. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, I can get more into this during my, my 90 minutes tomorrow, but I went to a, a relatively new program as well, and I'm very happy with where I am at this time. Mm -hmm. um, Another question, um, this is, yeah, different uh, question here. So do you feel that folks in general have started becoming more aware in terms of like microaggressions and racism? Um, and yeah, if so I guess, yeah, what, what, where are we seeing with regards to that? Yeah, definitely folks are more aware. They're more, they understand that uh, we, people now understand, okay, it, my words have impact. It just doesn't matter what I meant. Oh, I meant it as a joke that people understand that, okay, there is impact. and. <laughs> there is more accountability for folks and there is, I think, more humility. And as, you know, as folks age out of medicine and newer folks come in, I, it's, it's great to see that more people have their eyes open and their hearts open to being better colleagues and allies for each other. And, you know, I give a lot of lectures on this topic and there will always be, I will always get comments, oh, you know, this is a waste of my time. And that's, that's, that's okay. That's your perspective, you know, the fact that I got an hour to give you my perspective, I know I, I, I take that as a win, that you got to hear a different perspective and maybe you'll hear, take away 1%, but um, you know, I can't change everyone's mind, but I, at least I have a, a forum and a podium to, to have people listen when maybe they would have otherwise just you know shut it down and ignored everything completely and not even been receptive to being a part of it. That was actually how we met um, was when you were doing your hour uh, for us in the psychiatry didactic. So yeah. very appreciated. And I do, um, I guess, just on this topic as well, we talked about a little more. It's more about having conversations, not quote unquote, canceling people. Um, mm. And I think that most people that are uh, trying to implement these ZNI initiatives, you know, with regards to whatever demographic, that's really the main goal. So this is going to be coming from more of the perspective of, uh, you know, working in faculty, um, you know, with residents. How do you give, you know, for critical feedback um, effectively? Mm. Um, usually we start by, um, by just getting their perspective. And so um, kind of like a lot of parts of medicine, how we train folks is, you know, okay, it's, we provide this as the feedback that we receive. This is the anonymous survey. Um, this is the faculty evaluation. Um, do, you, do you recall this incident? Do you recall this interaction? And what is your take on it? And then ask them to elaborate on it. And then, you know, I provide some education. I provide, you know, the perspective, the impact. Really, that's important. And so, yes, these were your words, but, you know, this is the impact that it had on the learner and to help them to see how when, when I do X, it comes across as Y, and this is the impact Z, which is really what we're, what we are trying to address is to not have negative impact on our colleagues. 
And, you know, that's, that's where we start. So not pointing fingers, you are bad, you are so this, you are so that, but instead, you know, you know, when you said this, this was the impact. The learner felt very, um, you know, they felt very um, alienated on this rotation, felt that they were being treated unfairly, felt this is how it makes us feel. Yeah, absolutely. And when I'm um, giving feedback to medical students, I kind of call it, I guess, you can, like a critical sandwich. Uh, so I sandwich, I start with something that they're doing well, and then maybe I'll mm -hmm. give my point where there could be some improvement. And then I'd also finish with something that, you know, another, I guess, positive point. And usually, I'll, from what I've heard, a lot of people, I mean, I like sandwiches. So I just like, I like, I don't know, when I was in anatomy, they always told me I did that, but I, I digress. Um, so this is another, I guess, in the similar um, program specific or just in general in terms of like um, uh, like medical education, have you ever had to fire a trainee and how, how do you decide to do that? What type of processes are uh, in place when that occurs? Um, yes, unfortunately we have. So we had, um, we have a system in place and every program will have a system in place of uh, giving feedback, putting in place a remediation plan or an improvement plan um, before anybody is ever fired. And so uh, know that that is the, the structure that you will be entering. And so not, nobody is ever fired out of like out of the blue unless there's something grossly egregious. Um, but if it's a performance issue, a medical knowledge issue, even a professionalism issue, um, there will be a, we will address it, we'll have a meeting and we will put a plan in place. I will give you resources. Uh, here is a book to read, How to Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Uh, we're gonna talk about this. You're gonna do these additional questions. You're gonna do these additional simulations to work on your critical care skills. Whatever identify, whatever is identified as a deficiency, we will put a plan in place for a resident to meet those, to meet those expectations. And if, you know, after those time period, three months, there's no improvement, We'll probably get an extra three month extension, maybe if things are not egregious. But then at that point, if there is no improvement, then a, a resident could be terminated. But there is a conversation and a plan that is always reasonable and that is you know, mutually agreed upon. Thank you for, for providing that insight. And um, exactly, so I think it's pretty standard across a lot of like ACGME programs is, you know, there's gonna be a meeting in place, like this is what we're gonna do. We wanna have some type of way to improve upon whatever there is that deficiency. And, and I appreciate you providing a little more uh, insight in terms of how that's handled the emergency medicine space. Yeah. But let me just um, say one more thing. Um, I mean, I'm sure in this group, it would never be a problem, but if there is a, like a gross professionalism issue where you put a video on you know, YouTube about a patient and you expose them, you know, that may be flagrant enough that somebody is just fired. If you have maybe uh, like a, a DUI coming, af coming from a party and you were drinking and driving, and that might be enough to have a, to have a resident fired. And so I don't have all those scenarios off the top of my mind, but just know that the gross unprofessionalism would not be tolerated. Yeah, thank you for providing that further clarification because of course there are some things that are, can be egregious enough when it's in that type of context. Um, so I believe um, we're about out of time for Dr. McIntosh. Um, any parting words that you'd like for the group um, before we take a quick intermission and then we'll resume at 4.30? Mm -hmm. um, I, this is a really exciting time for folks starting this next chapter of your life. And um, during residency, it's gonna be hard. It's gonna be challenging, but it should not be toxic. It should not be bad where you dread coming to work. You know, you should have parts of the job that challenge you, that push you outside of your comfort zone. Um, but at the end of the day, you should still derive joy from taking care of a human being who's in front of you, from connecting with them. And so uh, please make sure that that's part of the work that you're doing, that you always have that as, as the number one thing. And, and that, you know, it's a big, it's a big, big bite that you're taking each day to try to learn medicine, uh, to try to master this whole field. But just know that it's just one bite. Every day you come to work and today you learn more about, you know, the diagnostic criteria for schizophrenia. And then the next week you learn more about something. It's, it's just bite by bite, but you master each bit. Uh, you commit to a study plan for yourself. And that's, that's how you digest all of medicine. And that's how you get through it all. And so I wish you all good luck. Um, yeah, Gabby, please, Dr. Meyerson, please share my email address if anybody has any specific questions. 
And um, I will, I owe you all a website for the emergency medicine applicants so that you have it as a central repository of all the programs and know how to know what they're looking for. Dr. McIntosh, thank you so much for your time. Um, again, I know we've, uh, we're both have a very mutual interest in DEI initiatives and I know it's a Saturday afternoon. So thank you so much. You're welcome. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.